Hey everybody. In this video, I'm going to talk about what to do when you have a limited amount of time to image. Whether it's because you don't have time or because you are constrained by something like, oh, I don't know, say the weather. I think we're cursed. My name is Chris and welcome to my channel. Okay, so what can you image if you don't have much time? Well, uh, the obvious targets would be anything bright, so uh, pretty good magnitude, uh, relatively large so that you can capture it readily, and high enough in the sky so that you are less uh, affected by seeing and transparency. I have a handful of other suggestions. Um, you can always look at planets. Planets don't require that much time. You take short, high-quality videos and then you stack them afterwards. So, in fact, short breaks in clouds work out quite well for planetary astrophotography. Another idea would be the moon. Uh, the moon, at least while it's up, is a fantastic source of entertainment for a lot of people. Uh, I recently posted about the lunar landing sites uh, from the Apollo missions, whose general areas you can see through your telescope. And by general, I mean broad vicinity. Like you can see hundreds of kilometers in the area of the craters and mare where the Apollo missions landed. Don't go looking for the lunar landers. Now we've got an eclipse coming up in North America on April 8th. And if you're going to be in a location where you'll be able to experience it, now's a good time to uh, take the opportunity to test out your uh, solar imaging and your equipment and your approach. Now, personally, I'm going to be within the path of totality and I plan to make the most of it. Now, I'm still tweaking my procedure. I'm not quite there yet, but I hope to be within the next few weeks. Now, one of my personal favorite things to do when you don't have too much time to image is to capture some objects that you can add to your catalog collections. I don't know about you guys, but one of the first things that I did when I got into astronomy and astrophotography was to pursue the Messier catalog. Now, as you're probably all aware, Charles Messier lived in the late 1700s. He was a, he was a prolific comet chaser. Uh, he chased and found comets for the King of France, who was very much interested in comets. Uh, why? Well, we can speculate, but comets used to portend big happenings. So finding a comet and assigning meaning to it was something that one did back in those days. Now, along with finding comets, Charles Messier came across numerous objects that weren't comets, and he cataloged those. Some of these objects he had discovered himself, while others had been previously discovered by his contemporaries and astronomers who came before. What resulted was a list of 110 deep sky objects, ranging from nebulas to globular clusters to binary star systems to galaxies. What makes the Messier catalog interesting is that all of these objects are visible with a small telescope. One of the first things I did when I got into astrophotography was to start capturing images of the objects in Charles Messier's catalog. My catalog is far from complete, and some of the objects that I've imaged are of really questionable quality. But collecting the objects in the catalog is a bit of a hobby unto itself. I periodically go back and re-image some of the objects that I've imaged before in order to improve upon them. Now, last year, when I added the filter tray to my setup, I really got sidetracked with imaging nebulas. However, with sky conditions being what they were, I've gone back over the last six weeks to add to my collection. So I ended up adding four objects, uh, three galaxies and a binary star. Now, the object that I started with was in Virgo. It was 
a barred spiral galaxy called Messier 61. And this one gave me the hardest time. So according to this, the galaxy is somewhere in this vicinity. I'm going to assume that that is the galaxy right there. Plate solving did that for me. I'm going to start up a capture plan. Now, it's fairly dim at magnitude 9.7. However, it's brighter than the other two galaxies that I captured. So I could only guess that while I was imaging M61, the seeing conditions and the sky transparency were extra bad. And reviewing my time lapses of those nights, I think that was true. Messier 61 is also the object that I spent the most time on with a total of two hours of integration time. Now, truth is I spent a lot more time trying to image it, but most of those frames had to be thrown away because as you guessed it, cloud cover. The binary star was actually a optical binary. So uh, Messier 40, the stars are not gravitationally bound. They're actually separated by about uh, 500 light years but looking from our vantage point, they look very close together. Now, as luck would have it, the guest speaker at my astronomy club this month uh, came in to talk to us about binary stars, which made capturing Messier 40 or Winnecke 4 pretty interesting and timely. The third object I want to capture was M108. M108, another Bard spiral galaxy in Ursa Major, uh, was a magnitude 10 object, which was the dimmest of all of them. And yet it was also the one that I found the easiest to capture, which again had to do with sky conditions, I'm sure. Now the fact that I could get a magnitude 10 galaxy in a matter of one hour's integration time amazes me. And I think a lot of that is owed to the cooled ASI 294 MC Pro camera. I think if I had been shooting with a regular DSLR, there would have been no way that I would have been able to see anything. The final object that I captured was M109. M109, yet another Bart spiral galaxy, came in at magnitude 9.8. So it sat a little dimmer than uh, M61, but definitely brighter than the surfboard galaxy M108. Nothing too exciting about this image, but we do have a couple of faint galaxies appearing in the background. Now, since we're talking about the Messier catalog, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to try to capture Comet 12P Pond Brooks, which is making its closest approach to the sun this spring. Now, the comet was fairly low on the horizon and was only really visible within a couple of hours of sunset. I plan to image it with a 135 millimeter Rokinon which meant that I could only capture it higher up in the sky because as it sank lower, I would get rooftops from neighboring homes coming into my field of view. And once again, the clouds rolled in and I didn't have much time, but I was able to get about 30 minutes worth of images, which I pared down to a smaller number of frames that I then stacked. I was really hoping that the skies would clear and just in time they did. And just after I managed to focus a little bit on one star uh, and shift my telescope into position, clouds had rolled back in and I couldn't see the comet. But then they parted and they've stayed clear or somewhat clear uh, for the last 15, 20 minutes. So I think I've got at least 10, 15 minutes of uh, 15 second images on uh, comet uh, Pond Brooks. And I realized that I'd forgotten to put in my UV IR cut filter, which resulted in bloated stars. Now, since that evening, the weather forecast had called for mostly clear skies four separate times. And four separate times, I've gotten my telescope set up and ready to go. However, every one of those nights ended up completely clouded over. So I'm left with just my one and only attempt. Now, this was my first time trying to image a comet and I'm pretty psyched that I was able to capture anything at all. That's it for this video. Uh, if you guys have a favorite catalog that you like to collect from, let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and clear skies.